So yeah, so you can think of it a little bit like uh, qualitative research search, or you could call it enterprise sales. So I like to think of it as cool qualitative research. But uh, so uh, just a little bit of uh, background to me to sort of give you a per perspective. So you know, I'm an ex-academic who's come to San Francisco to do the start San Francisco startup thing. I'm a co-founder of Sense. Uh, we're building a sort of a collaborative platform for enterprise data science. Um, I'm not going to talk at all about you know Sense itself. Uh, I'd be happy to talk with anybody afterwards about Sense. But one of the things that Sense has given me the opportunity to do is to talk to a huge number of data science teams throughout all different industries, all different sizes of companies. And so, you know, in the last nine months, I was just looking through the database. Uh, I've talked to 176 uh, data science teams um, within industry. And so, one, that just gives you a good idea that there are 176. You know, we're a small startup, and we're talking to 176 data science teams. And I just did that by them, you know, in you know, emailing me. So. You know, there's tremendous interest in data science throughout industry, um, and you know, you obviously, I'm going to try to save some time at the end because you know I've you know talked to all these people. I'm sure you have unique you know questions about where the industry is going, where the technology is going. Every time I talk to them, I sort of say, you know, what technology are you guys using? Uh, you know, what does your team look like? You know, what problems are you having? You know, and then I talk a little bit about what what Sense does, but would be you know very happy to share you know the lessons learned there, and I'm also happy to share any lessons about you know, starting a, a, a startup in the uh, data science space. But um, just to kind of give you a little bit of an overview before going to questions uh, in terms of you know, how I think about the future of data science at a very, very high level. So I basically think we're in, in this world <laughs> where clearly there's a tremendous amount of excitement around data. And that's pervading every industry, every person that I talk to. Everybody's excited about data. We're seeing magazine covers like this. You know, Is data the new god? You know, big data, the revolution that will transform uh, the way we live, work, and think. But we're also in a situation which is a little bit like this, where, <laughs> where a lot of people, we sort of think, okay, well, you know, we'll, we'll buy Hadoop, we'll get Hadoop, we'll collect a lot of, you know, data, we'll, we'll store it, um, maybe we'll hire a data scientist uh, because we hear that's the new hot thing. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, this, this, this like machine super intelligence is going to emerge and, you know, our business is going to be transformed. We're going to be making tons of money. We're going to have the best baseball team in the world but because we did some data science. You know, maybe, that's, maybe that sometimes works. Um, and, uh, but it's a little bit, uh, you know, I think it is a little bit, you know, then a miracle occurs for uh, many, many companies. And I've certainly heard that. That's one of the themes that I've heard from companies is, you know, they've made investments in the data infrastructure. There's excitement all the way up at the top executive level. Uh, but there's, a, there's definitely a struggle to actually extract value from data. Uh, that's, there's no question about that. Uh, there's investments that have been idled. Uh, you know, there's, uh, there's data scientists that teams have, that have been hired. They produced amazing reports but they're not actionable. And then they've been, you know, sort of the executives don't know what to do with them. And so uh, I think if I were to say what's the, the future, uh, you know, of data science over the next, you know, short, short run, um, it's really going to be about sorting this out. It's going to be about, so how do we make this hyper reality? And hopefully, uh, you know, people here are probably familiar with like the AI winter uh, back in the day where, you know, there was a lot of hype around artificial intelligence. Uh, it didn't really pan out, uh, you know, 20 years ago. And then you know we kind of had a you know a, a major downturn in research funding and a whole bunch of things. And so hopefully that's not going to happen. And I don't think it will because I think the potential for data uh, is certainly you know if I think about all the applications that people are telling me uh, about, they're real applications. If you bring uh, sort of you know data science to the to the data, you can actually have transformative impacts um, within these companies. And so the key thing is actually you know how you go about do, doing that. And uh, I think there are basically a few major components. And so just to touch on them at a very high level. So the first is people. And this is a data science crowd. And so there's good news here is that, uh, you know, it's a good time to be a data scientist. So you've probably seen this graph. You know, it goes, you know, skyrocketing up. I have no idea. Somebody needs to do a data science little study about, you know, what's going on right there in 2000, whatever, January 13 or whatever it is. Um, but uh, it's certainly skyrocketing. The demand for data scientists is skyrocketing. Basically, at the end of every conversation I have with, it, with these enterprise data science teams, I'm you know, I want them to buy sense and adopt it. But uh, in reality, they say, well, do you know any good data scientists? <laughs> so, so, and I'm like, yeah, I would hire them if I did, yeah. So, um, so, uh, so obviously, there's, you know, it's a great time to be a data scientist. That's one. But I would also say you, know, you should be a little bit humble. So there's maybe a little bit of arrogance creeping into the data science world. And uh, in terms of you know how sweet it is to be a data scientist, and here's two graphs to show you that. So keep 
data science in perspective. So here is AngularJS, which is a random JavaScript framework, okay? It's for, you know, a front-end framework for building web apps. And that's the graph for, for AngularJS, and that's the graph, the blue one is there for data scientists, right? So the reality is, you know, data, scientists, data science is a great role. It's a tre tremendously interesting role. I mean, it's an intellectually satisfying role. Uh, you know, I prefer to be a data scientist than an AngularJS developer. I find myself in kind of sometimes splitting the, between the two, but, um, but just keep in mind that, you know, uh, there's other things that are, that, are, that are ramping up as well. Um, the other thing that I would point out in terms of just sort of keeping, keeping things in perspective as a data scientist is data scientists do not have a monopoly on big data, okay? And that's definitely the true within the, within the enterprise context. So data science, one of the, in some ways, disappointing aspects of when I started Sense was we were data scientists, my co-founder and I, you know, we thought data, we put data science at the center of the, in, the, in the universe, right? For us, it was, you know, front and center. It's all we thought about. But every company we talked to, including huge companies, the data science teams are small, right? So the biggest data science teams I've seen, you know, these are companies with 100,000 employees. But they got like 50 data scientists. So these are small groups of people, and they're working collaboratively with, you know, much bigger groups. And so just always, you know, kind of always remember, uh, you know, that. And that, you know, if you build your skills to collaborate either with kind of data engineers who are in the engineering department or with business users who are, you know, kind of on the other side, um, that's typically, I think, where uh, the most success happens. And in fact, some data science teams have now been split, like LinkedIn's data science team has been split from a standalone unit uh, to now serving either the IT organization, which is, you know, with the engineers, or with the kind of the business analytics organizations. So, the, so that's kind of people. So, you know, just, you know, data scientists, great to be a data scientist, but, you know, keep in mind that, you know, you've got to play well with others, and there's more, you know, within a, within a business, there's, 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 uh, there's, there's a lot of other people who care about data and you're going to interact with. And if you just view yourself as a researcher, you know, it's pro that's probably not, unless you go to like the Google Brain team, you know, that's probably not uh, typically how data science is, is done. So it's much more collaborative up there. So um, now tools. So what's the future of tools? Well, the first thing is, you know, in a gold rush, right, you, you know, it's great to sell shovels. So that's kind of the motto. And that still applies, that does apply to, uh, in, the, in the data science world. And so, you know, we are, we're, we're, at Sense, we're a benefit, beneficiary of this. But clearly, there's a lot of companies that are selling data infrastructure. There's a lot of opportunities to sell tools uh, and things that kind of help people, you know, either store data or, or consume data. But, you know, that's, you know, you do, you know, people obviously don't just want to buy shovels and live the dream. At some point, kind of the reality hits, or the, or the you know, the rubber hits the road. Um, and so I would say the other thing, that, the other trend that I'm going to, that I see with data scientists and a tool like Sense is that future tools really need to focus not just on data scientists, but bringing data scientists and business teams together. So the reality is data scientists always need to deliver value and, be, and see their value being delivered throughout, the, throughout an enterprise or a business. Or throughout the scientific, you know, if you're in a pharma company, you know, actually get, get you to a drug, a new drug or something like that. So future tools um, definitely, I think, aren't going to be just data scientists focused. Um, but even if they, if they respect data scientists, they, they, should, they should still uh, deliver uh, value to business teams. So, I mean, if you're like an R user, like Shiny is an example of that. Like, you know, tons in the business context, it's like people love Shiny because it's like you get to deliver something to a business team. But clearly, there, you could do a lot more in that, in that area, building a data product, delivering a data product. Um, I would also say there's going to be an explosion uh, in industry-specific tools that don't require data scientists but are embedded, that have data science inside them. And so I think one of actually, the, if you're thinking about starting a startup, one of the more interesting areas actually is to build a vertical BI or business analytics tool. So all the work that you would do custom here, right, so even that, pre I saw the end bit of that previous presentation on, you know, looking at uh, uh, pitching and hitting. So if you think about that, you did a bunch of analysis, and you maybe did, you worked for a, a, a sports team. That would be great. You, you, you know, they would love you. But at some point, then say, well, why don't you just build like an amazing solution and sell it to all the sports teams out there, right? And that's going to happen. That is happening already over and over again. And so data scientists are going to continually compete with vertical solutions within particular industries. And those could be, you know, things like, you know, ch analysis of churn, you know, inventory forecasting, fr raw, fr you know, risk modeling, fraud detection, cybersecurity, uh, uh, you know, adverse event detection in a, you know, a pharma company, uh, you know, healthcare monitoring for a, for a, for a, for a hospital, uh, et cetera. So I think, you know, this is, you know, hopefully this won't put you guys out of a job. Hopefully you'll just be building these tools. So, and I do think that there are actually always going to be a role for data scientists because the reality is if you want to out-compete, you've got to do something unique. And so there's always opportunities for ingenuity. And that's sort of one of the big things that we always tell people. It's like if you want to out-compete your competitors, then you've got to have a data scientist bring, bring in data science and build out a data science practice. And I think that does resonate with most people. 
So this is sort of off the same, not just tools. We don't just need tools, we need applications. And I would say, so this is just kind of, you know, I've talked to huge numbers of uh, uh, different industries. I think one of the lessons there that I've learned is actually how diverse uh, data science is. Every industry that you can imagine uh, is using data science now is an interested, interested in data science. Actually, one of the most stitch, fit, stitch fix, which is based in San Francisco, you, some of you may know it, it's a, it's a fashion company, basically. It's honestly got one of the most sophisticated data science teams that, in San Francisco. So it's you know, an industry that you wouldn't expect, but they're doing incredibly sophisticated stuff on image recognition and all the stuff about to recommend you know, fashion to, to, their, to their customers. And they have a great blog as well. So there's tons and tons of opportunities um, all over the place. Uh, and that, I think, is, you know, that, so, you know, that's, that's going to continue. Um, I, I would say in that context that, you know, keep some, like, if you're working in an academic environment, there's a lot of times, like, you download that image labeling data set, and you're like, wow, I can label images, right? I can put, oh, and then I can not just do an individual label, like, this is a cat or a dog. I can say, this is a cat, like, sitting on a sofa. That's a, on a red sofa. And it's really impressive. Deep learning, things like that have generated really impressive results on, on things like, you know, you know, image recognition, video classification, et cetera. But I probably have talked to one company that had a need out of 170 that had a need for image labeling. It was basically a security, you know, they wanted to monitor, you know, uh, national security like video feeds, right? And they wanted to classify, uh, you know, what was in the, basically make it text searchable, all the images. The vast majority of the rest, you know, it's, it's, it's companies that are trying to manage customers, manage sales, manage supply chain. Uh, you know, drug companies trying to measure, measure make sure they can develop new drugs, they can monitor adverse events, et cetera. So I definitely think, you know, keep in mind, don't get too sucked into the, you know, your toy data sets. You know, always keep in mind the kind of the end uh, business application. So that's uh, sort of just the applications, trends around applications. Um, the final thing is science, obviously data science. And so this is uh, clearly the, uh, <laughs> what's get, what gets me excited, but um, so the goal, nobody wants to admit it, but the goal is mach machine super intelligence. So it's an awesome, awesome goal, right? And uh, we're going to build these intelligence machines, and, and, there, and there's tons and tons and tons of work uh, to be done still on this, on this front. This isn't, you know, I think there's about five teams right now in the world that are putting tons and tons of money behind this, but the average company probably isn't doing this, right? They're just trying to improve kind of, the kind of a little bit more basic bottom line business result. But there is an incredibly amount of exciting work there. And the two things that I would say there are, from what, from what I've seen, are two kind of lessons in terms of this kind of science and where research is going, um, is the binding constraint still isn't, isn't, isn't always the algorithm, it's often the data. And um, what I mean by that, it's actually kind of interesting to think of what are the problems where data science is actually struggling, but we actually have good data. There's not that many of that, them, right? With image label, like the, the data sets that we now have, that if the, you have a really good data set, like a training data set, a big data set, millions or billions of records, and you have like, you know, the, the, the objective that you're trying to, trying to achieve, the algorithms actually do pretty well. So, and then you say, well, I can't write a book. Okay, well, something like that. Okay, I can't write a, I can't write a book. But the question is, do you have a data set where if you, you know, were to generate a book, you'd have the metric, like, is this book successful? Now, it's probably not going to be able to generate a book, but there, there's a real, you know, there, there, there are many domains, or, and there are many innovations that have happened by people just bringing new data sets to, you know, old algorithms or kind of these newer algorithms, deep learning algorithms. And those data sets could be real data sets, or they could even be synthetic data sets. Facebook's... Uh, a, uh, AI research team has, has like some really cool things where they simulate uh, stories and then they try to you know, ask questions from stories. So they simulate these like text adventure games and then they ask questions about, like logical questions about what happened in that story. And because they can simulate these hundreds of thousands and millions of, 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 of stories, they can actually build a machine that can uh, lear learn from them pretty well. So the other, one, the other one that I would say I'm excited by in terms of um, uh, you know, I think, I think the where, the where things are headed in terms of data science on the science side is I think that we're going to move towards a future where uh, away from prediction and towards planning. So this is really trying to close the loop. You know, if in the earlier picture we had the data scientists, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the baseball example, it's the data scientist and the business user sitting together. The data scientist presents some results and then the business user makes some decision about what to do based on that. Well, why not get rid of that, right? Why not just close the loop, right? And so uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of data science right now is focused on prediction. Um, but increasingly, it's going to be focused on, on uh, I, I believe, on, on actual uh, planning and optimal decision making. So this is an example. I don't know. You know, some of you may have seen this. This is a basically a paper uh, out of the, the Deep Mind group that got bought by Google for four hundred million dollars. So there's something probably there. They didn't have a product, right? But they still got bought for that. So um, this is a paper that they wrote. It's about how to play Atari, 
And the thing that it did was just sort of give you an idea what I mean by kind of, it's, it's, it's called deep reinforcement learning. So it's kind of a mashup of reinforcement learning and deep, deep learning. And the, the quick summary is basically they built a machine that could look at a Atari games, these old games, and they could just take in the pixels. They didn't know anything about the game. It didn't know if, what it was playing, Pac-Man. It didn't know anything about the game. It could just look at the pixels. And they managed to build a thing that could play all these different games just by looking at the pixels with, no, with, with a totally generic algorithm. So it's kind of like, like an intelligence that now is learning to not just understand what's going on in that world, but also plan throughout that world, right? And if you think about the same, you know, the same thing in the business context, I don't want to just forecast inventory. I want to say, what is the optimal inventory? What is the optimal price, right? What is the optimal action that I, that, that I could take? And there's, you can potentially generate huge returns, and as a data scientist, that's terrific. There's an example of like an IBM group that did, you know, like optimal tax uh, sort of collection for New York State, and they generated like 90 million additional dollars per year by basically building an algorithm that would like send reminder notices that your taxes are due and things like that. And it basically was a deep uh, reinforcement learning algorithm and it generated huge returns. So uh, I think, you know, this general trend towards uh, from prediction to planning is, is key. So anyway, there's the th th that's just what I wanted to kind of give very high overview, kind of just thinking about a little bit about where things are headed in terms of you know, people, tools, applications, the science. I'm definitely happy to answer sort of questions. Uh, my basic takeaway is that the future is incredibly exciting. Uh, and so you're, you've chosen, you've, I think, a good a th thing to be involved in. Uh, but luckily, there's work still to be done. So I mean, I think there's probably easily 20, 50 years of, of work to be done, which is good, right? Because then it's a lifetime. Uh, and that's always nice to have something that you can do for your whole life. So Great. thanks. So yeah, I'd be happy to take questions. But Thanks very much. <laughs> so just in the 10 minutes we have left, Great, please, <coughs> questions for Tristan, or if you want to offer your own perspective, okay, what's the future of data science for you? So let's just take you know, either questions or perspectives from yourselves. Yes, we'll take the first one here, and then we'll go to the back. Um, so first of all, I'm, I'm also very optimistic about uh, the future of data science, but, but I'd like to get your opinion on, um, my personal opinion is, is that uh, there, there will be less Opportunity for data scientists to work in larger corporations because I don't I don't see a larger corporation having a sustainable uh, retention for a data scientist group because most of the large corporation has its own core competency. So once it is able to extract value out of its data and able to operationalize it, it will try to sustain and milk that cash cow as long as possible. And during that time it's not going to need a data scientist or a team of them yeah. until it, 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 it couldn't get much milk out of it anymore and then you will you, you screen out um, and, and then call for help and then maybe you will, at that time you will try to hire a data scientist or look for consultants. So I, I see data scientists more working as a consultant role, more like um, what you are trying to do here and, and I see that as as going to be the increasingly normal operation mode for data scientists. Um, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, interesting. So, um, so there definitely is a role for data science consultants, but I actually, I actually would disagree with that. Um, so if, if I look at sort of the, the, the average role that I see with a data scientist within a company, it's not really building like a product that can be commercialized and then you like fire the team and you just milk it as a cash cow. Like, uh, it could be kind of cool if that was the case. I mean, it's kind of fun as a data scientist. You build a cool product, you go on and build another cool one. But that's not really what I tend to see. So what we tend to see is uh, data science teams, are, the data in a large enterprise is sitting everywhere. There are literally like 500 data stores that are sitting everywhere. And there's kind of an infinite amount of requests coming up from business teams. And a lot of those requests cannot be answered by traditional analysts who are kind of have a SQL-based mindset. So whoever it's just kind of I'm going to query the data and do some basic reporting. People want to do more than that. And so that tends to be the role, like the, the first level role of data, maybe this isn't your, isn't your view of a data scientist. Maybe your view is that they're building like, you know, kind of like a brain and they're going to put it into a product and that product is going to be smart. But I would say that's the vast minority of folks uh, that I see that have the title data scientist. It's, you know, it's usually like it's, a, you know, you're in a retail company and it's somebody saying, like how well did that promotion work for, for, for Thanksgiving? Like the, was Black Friday a good promotion? Like should we, should we, you know, should we do, you know, it's, 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 it's basic stuff and, and, but it's, it's stuff that, you know, that where SQL, like uh, an analyst can't really cut it. And so I see that as kind of gro growing over, over time ultimately. Uh, and it seems that a lot of people will be embedded into the product, right? For example, yes, 
for example, yesterday at yeah. Salesforce, we saw the, their product embedding collaborative filtering. So yeah. anyone with that product at hand can build a recommendation engine with a relatively decent performance. It still can be improved, obviously, but uh, that's what I was trying to get. Yeah, to. no, I mean, I do think that you're always, are, you are always going to face competition because, because the reality is, it's, you know, if you, let's say you wanted to do like cohort-based churn analysis, like it's, you could do that as a data scientist, not just like how are people falling off from your product. You know, you could do that with your tool like R. You could sit down in R and you could do that. But you could go to Mixpanel and they'll give you really, really nice reports that like, yeah, you could regenerate, but you could do this in like two seconds. So that's sort of where I say like industry specific vertical solutions. I do think that there's, there's definitely a threat to data scientists from those industry specific vertical solutions because even data scientists would prefer just to use something that's off the shelf. I, I would say the thing that makes your, your job secure is that data is so messy and none of these tools can handle that. And uh, that I've seen, and I don't really see any much hope there, uh, or or at least there's plenty of uh, messy data to, to 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 deal with, and you know, sort of new questions to and ask. That gives so. hope in and of itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Question right at the back, and then we'll come down to the middle to Michael. Yeah. So. Um, so kind of feeding off that, um, one of my favorite things about data science, and the thing that I'm hoping to hang my hat on is really that um, most business people, they're really good at business, but they're, it takes this kind of certain skill set to not only to understand what the outcome of data science, like what you're getting out of, but then how to interpret that and present it in an informative way and maybe even an entertaining way. So this, um, it comes up a lot in curriculum that we're doing and just in general when I'm reading about like telling stories and so I was wondering what you've noticed in the trends. So even, I mean, this, the reason I think it bounces off that is the idea of even with the full stack models, where do you see the role of data scientists as storytellers? Is, is that something that we can maybe hope, hope that if we're really good at making some, some PowerPoint presentations, yeah. <laughs> that, that, yeah. that, that'll save us from the robots? Because I don't think they're going to, uh, I think that might be a skill we can hope Skynet will take the longest to develop. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Well, the good news is the deliverable is often still PowerPoint. So uh, you know, oftentimes you, <laughs> so you know that you know, oftentimes you know, you build all this crazy stuff, and at the end of the day, they want you to pull it out, put it into PowerPoint, get that get that you know picture that you put in, put it into PowerPoint. You go in there and you you know talk to the the business team about what your conclusions are. So so that is it. So I think that is yeah. So you're that is a definitely something that we see as like a dominant deliverable. We always think like, what's the deliverable of the data science? The kind of the PowerPoint presentation is the ad hoc analysis is what definitely what we is, is a major one that we see I do think that like the one where you kind of well you might put yourself out of business but the one that's the most disruptive is where you have a metric you do something and that metric goes up I mean it's just and somebody was saying like you know know your metric kind of before you start your project and that is just game-changing I mean if you just because I mean if you're dealing if you're at a Walmart or if you're at one of these major companies and you move things a little bit I mean you've generated huge quantities of money and if you think about yourself and your creativity that you have in, innate, you probably can do it. Like, you have a lot of data, you have a lot of creativity with, with the data science, you can probably move some of those numbers. So there's a you know, if you can do that, there's a huge payoff. Now maybe it turns into a product and then you, you know, it's not sustaining. That might be, that might be true, but. Sorry. Sorry, what was that? Can your competitor get the same product you up your game? Yeah. Michael, you're doing like that. You, um, you uh, showed us a graph of uh, showing that uh, data scientist has a certain small proportion of the total big data jobs. And also, uh, I think you've managed to interview more uh, data scientist teams than probably anyone else in the room. So I was wondering if you could speak to uh, the types of demographic, like education demographics uh, of the different teams and how that maps to the type of work they do. Like, uh, obviously, yeah. this. Uh, Atari, so, the deep mind, is a very different demographic to totally say. Totally different. Yeah, this is a bunch. Yeah, the last one. Yeah, that's yeah. a bunch of PhDs. Yeah. So, yeah. so you know, machine, you know, CS, PhD, machine learning people. Um, but uh, yeah, so the, the demographics I see are, I think it's pretty clear actually. The typology. It's business teams. Okay. So these are business users who are often the people with, with budgets. They want things to. They want to know things. So it's often you're doing stuff uh, to benefit. You know, ultimately to deliver something to the business team. Um, uh, it's analysts. So there's far more analysts than there are data scientists. And the way I would say analyst is like a, like a, the loose definition is like a power SQL user. So SQL, as, when I was in academia, I was like SQL, like I want to do everything in R. 
But the like, reality is like in enterprise, it's all the data sitting in relational databases and like SQL is dominant. And there's all sorts of tools around that world, that analyst role. And so there's a SQL, a Power SQL user. And they're often being asked by the business team about what the result, you know, what the results are. And then there's a data scientist who's, in a, who's a growing role to do more than SQL, go beyond BI. And that's, I think, the, the, the trend that I see is companies say, I want to go beyond BI, be, you know, beyond, beyond SQL, I want to do more than reporting, so you bring your data scientist. And then the fourth one is engineering. You call it data engineer if you want to just kind of, you know, say pure engineers or somewhere else, but data engineers. And so those are the people responsible for the data infrastructure. Uh, and basically, it's usually a different, like if you have run a Hadoop cluster, you know, there's people that are, you know, kind of your data engineers. It's off, also often the people, uh, if you're building a product that's smart, that, you know, you do need to be kind of an engineer. So, you know, the, I mean, even like collaborative, if you're building the collaborative filtering within LinkedIn, a lot, there's a pretty heavy, you know, engineering component to that. Or the, you know, the news feed, rec you know, algorithm on, you know, maybe the, re the data scientists are doing some research on it. But at the end of the day, that's getting rolled out by engineering because it's a huge, huge, uh, endeavor that you know needs to run reliably and to go at tremendous scale. So but those are the kind of the four, four, the four roles. And I would say data scientist is the smallest, the smallest role in there. But the cool thing is, it's kind of it gets to talk to everybody, and it's a lever to do to do to, to kind of do differentiated things in, in these other domains. So I think companies recognize that. Let's not, let's uh, we got time for two more questions, and we're going to go Jason, and then we'll go into the middle there, and then. So building off of what you just said, um, I'm a former management consultant who worked at a lot of retail organizations, okay. just like you're talking about. Um, and I, I'm a, mid a former mid-student now, I'm, I'm now an alumnus, and I'm trying to bridge that gap from the second to the third group. And I, the, the, you, you know, the, yep. is it the analyst, it's power SQL user, yep. to the data scientist, let's go beyond business intelligence. Yep. Um, and I have found the same thing that you said. There's a lot of analyst jobs, and there's a relatively small number of data science jobs that are using R or going you know, beyond Excel or beyond SQL. I'm wondering if you, um, so right now it's kind of bifurcated the way I see it. Yeah. You have this, you know, this group that's like largely PhDs and you have this other group that's like largely you know, analyst kind of backgrounds. Um, do you, I mean this, this program is an attempt to bridge that gap, right? A, a lot of, it's a master's program, um, it's, it's very applied. The idea is that people can come from backgrounds and with some programming experience, some stats experience and then be able to do that work that's beyond business intelligence. Do you think over time that there's going to be, those two groups will become closer together or that they're going to be further bifurcated? That, you know, machine learning is popular, yeah. there's more PhDs and, and like that's going to be its own siloed thing or that they're going to meld together over time? Uh, I think there's always going to be like the, the, a, the AI component, research component, but put, I don't, you know, put that, put that aside for the moment. But so I would say definitely coming together. So unquestionably coming together. And they're coming together on two levels. The human level, which is knowing how to talk to one another, so that's both on both directions. Data, you know, analysts appreciating what data scientists do, and data science, and uh, you know, appreciating the role of analysts. And analysts often know the data better than the data scientist. So you know, that's going to come together on the human level. And then there's definitely going to be a c coming together on the tools level as well. So at Sense, you know, our holy goal, goal, you know, Grail end goal is to bring together business teams, analysts, and data scientists. We started with data scientists, but the end goal is to bring those teams together. And you can do a lot with technology to sort of have a fluid workflow and collaborative experience across those different tools. Whereas if you just are in Tableau, I mean, what's the data scientist going to do, right? So there's, a, there's a clearly, an, and, and the, the, the BI tools are moving towards data science and the data science tools are moving towards BI. So there's, there's going to be a convergence of that, I think, where you have a, a technologically, you have a much fluider uh, sort of landscape. Yeah. So I would say definitely closer, yeah. Okay, so. Um, as aspiring data scientists, as many of the people in this room are, we want to do really cool stuff with data. We want to build really cool products. We want to use advanced machine learning models. We want to do advanced statistics. In my experience, most business users don't really care. They're just, give me the product. Give me the final answer. And so some of my biggest wins have been just given basic statistic yeah. intuition to people. And I'm wondering, as a data scientist going forward, how much of it is going to be educating basic statistics and how much of it is going to be building cool stuff? Because... <laughs> well, yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, the, I mean, the reality is you can get very far by taking averages. So, I mean, really far. <laughs> so, uh, 
you know, getting your data into the right shape and then taking an average, you know, by day, by week, by minute, you know, and seeing your graph and have it go up. You don't even need a confidence interval, honestly. Like, <laughs> so, so, yeah, so that's kind of depressing. But, but um, you know, but uh, so, so that, that is a truth. That is a truth. Um, I guess, uh, you know, if, if you can, you know, if you can move a metric with rocket science, you know, everybody loves you and, and that's, that's great. So there's opportunities, I think, you know, to sort of, you know, think about, uh, you know, optimizing in, like things where, especially where you want to take the human out of it. So when you close the loop, like what I was saying with plan planning, if you, t if, if you build this, if you can build something that sort of is, you know, is, is automated, right, you know, then it can be quite advanced, right? You don't, because I mean, the problem with the really advanced stuff is, you know, you go, nobody wants to sit in a meeting and you go random for, like the business, they don't, it's not, it's not a, you can't evaluate what's going on. Plus you have no, I mean, it's, it's just too hard. It's too hard to evaluate. Now, if you can close the loop, you know, show a metric going up, kind of keep it as a black box, you know, then I think you can end up doing lots of advanced stuff. Or you can join Facebook's AI team, Google's AI team, Baidu's AI team, you know, Twitter's AI team. There's like five AI teams and you'll do really cool stuff. But, uh, you know, I think that's a subset of, um, of what's going on, yeah. Tristan, thanks so much for uh, all your perspectives this afternoon. Please.